I'm uh, talking to uh, Jack McConnell, the former First Minister of the Scottish Parliament and now uh, a Labour member of the House of Lords. And I must say, Jack, looking at you yesterday in your interview with, uh, uh, with Alan Little at uh, Beyond Borders, I was, uh, I'm afraid I succumbed to a certain degree of charm because here was a chap with a lot of vivacity and evidently a life outside politics. Uh, you mentioned that you were a teacher during the day at the beginning mm -hmm. and uh, a politician at night. What what drove you to become a politician? Oh, I think it's the general sense of injustice. I, I I grew up on the Isle of Arran, off the west coast of Scotland, in a family that had no politicians at all, even in the wider family of cousins and aunts and uncles. Uh, but I did. I suppose I read a lot. I watched a lot of TV documentaries at a time when. That was becoming a very powerful medium and I developed a sense of uh, interest in the world but also a sense of injustice and and that drove me into politics. I wasn't involved in party politics until my 20s but I was I was involved in political campaigning as a teenager. Yeah well you're still a very young man uh, I, I and, uh, feel, the, feel that way. <laughs> and there is uh, there, there is life after the Scottish Parliament, there's yeah. life in the House of Lords but mm. uh, I gather that you also take a very active interest in uh, international mediation and maybe it's also part of this business to try to correct injustices. Yes, I mean, I, I'm all, I've always been interested in international development and in global poverty, but the people who are poorest in the world, the people who suffer the worst violence, the people who have the worst conditions, the least hope, are those who live in conflict-affected areas, and, uh, even areas that are post-conflict, and so therefore they matter the most. And I spend most of my time now either speaking about or working on that. And what do you think, what, what uh, comparative advantage do, do, you, do you think your experience brings or do you think that Scotland brings to this area of activity? Well I think in the world today almost all the really significant conflicts in the world today are uh, in larger states that have a significant regional or sub-national minority who feel disenfranchised, disempowered discriminated against historically and this, the permanent solution to those conflicts has to involve some measure of political empowerment for those people in their area and when, and that's true in the Philippines, it's true in Myanmar, Burma, it's true in large parts of the Middle East, it's probably true in Nigeria and the Congo as well uh, and, and I think that uh, the, the, the solution we found to that very peacefully here in Scotland in the UK uh, with very strong devolution is a model that can work in my experience of running the government in Scotland. It gives me an opportunity to pass that on and, and I enjoy that. I'm doing it just now in the Philippines and, I, and, and I've helped elsewhere and I, I think there's, in, in the years to come there's going to be a real role for people who have run sub-national governments trying to make some of these political settlements last. Tell us what you're doing in the Philippines, I was curious. Yeah, it's interesting. I'd, in the Philippines, there's been a lot of conflict in the Philippines over the years, uh, of different kinds. But uh, since 1968, there has been effectively a civil war in the southern island of Mindanao, where the historic uh, Muslim population have gradually been squeezed into a smaller and smaller area over the years by the Catholic majority, uh, have been at, at war with the state. They signed a big peace agreement last year in which they say they accept the sovereignty of the Philippines and they give up arms uh, and stand down combatants in return for a really big measure of devolution uh, that will see them run their own affairs following uh, democratic elections. And I am helping both in Manila and in Mindanao to try and uh, make that work. And uh, the process is difficult, it's challenging, but it's on, right, on the right track. And I hope that what I'm able to say and do is, is, is useful there. And if we, can, if we can succeed there in the Philippines, then the idea that there is a democratic, what would be relatively secular in, in many ways, uh, Muslim-led government uh, in a post-conflict scenario uh, could catch on elsewhere in the world. And that would be a quite a powerful agent for change, quite a powerful example. The World Bank uh, produced some figures that approximately 50% of peace agreements break down mm. within the, the first five years. Yep. Um, w w do you think you have a contribution to make in making sure that the peace agreement in uh, Mindanao is, is driven forward and so it does, that it doesn't slide back into conflict? I hope so. 
that's what I'm trying to do and what I've been asked to do and I, I think the one of the reasons for that statistic and I mean you'll know from your time at the UN just how difficult post-conflict development uh, is uh, one of the, the reasons for that I think is that if, unless the agreement is based on a just settlement and isn't just a negotiated uh, agreement of sharing power for example or winner takes all between those who were former combatants uh, uh, unless, unless there's a just settlement that gives people a chance to develop their own lives then uh, peace agreements will not last and I think where the international community has maybe got this wrong in the past is that they've given a lot of assistance to states uh, in, in these situations but where these regional conflicts or subnational conflicts have taken place they've not been as well uh, resourced to assist the people who are going to have to do the difficult work of managing the relationship between the, the region or the nation and the centre. Very often and some of us have done that, and you know we've, we've, we've made mistakes along the way, but we've done we've had successes too. And there are lots of people around the world who've, who've done this, and I'm just one of them. And I think that we could all make a much bigger contribution. And I'm hoping Beyond Borders may well be involved in, in partnering us in doing that. That would be very good. I, I, I get the impression that uh, that uh, what's called soft mediation mm. or weak mediation is something which is on the rise yes. because it's less threatening to particularly to the the government's concerns. Yeah. But another, another problem is that, uh, as, as, as in my experience, peace agreements very often leave unfinished business. And I would say in the Philippines, perhaps, uh, is the issue of, uh, of uh, accountability um, also on the agenda? Has, has that been tackled or is that left open? I think accountability is an issue on, on both sides. And, and unless, they, unless there's a genuine commitment on both sides, this agreement is going to struggle. I think the Islamic Front uh, are genuine about peace and I spent a bit of time in Mindanao itself just two months ago trying to assess that on the ground and I don't hear or see any evidence that would suggest that they are not very serious. But the rest of the Philippines has heard so many bad stories about them over the years. They've been painted as these you know, crazy violent people from the south um, that winning political support elsewhere in the Philippines for the peace agreement is more difficult than winning political support by criticising the peace agreement and there are elections yeah. there next year. So one of my jobs has been to try and uh, influence public opinion but also political opinion in Manila to say, look, you've got to give this a try. If, to take you back to Northern Ireland, for example, in 1998, if a few months after the uh, Good Friday Agreement, if uh, uh, Tony Blair and his government had responded badly to the OMA bombing, then we would not have a peace agreement in Northern Ireland today and a whole generation of Northern Irish youngsters wouldn't have gone through all their years of schooling uh, in, the, in, in relative peace. Uh, and in these situations, in my view, national politicians have to be very strong. So you need to look back and have accountability, but they also need to see the future as well. And at the moment, that's that's one of the big challenges in Manila at the moment. And I'm back there next month to, to talk about that again. Where do you think exactly uh, an organisation like uh, uh, like Beyond Borders fits, fits into that uh, jigsaw puzzle? Well, I'm a great believer in dialogue, and I uh, and, and and giving dialogue a chance to and all the ups and downs uh, that, that that involves. And if Beyond Borders has promoted anything over the years, it's, promote, it's, it's promoted critical thought, dialogue, openness, uh, bringing people together who might not normally meet, and doing that both here at Traquair, but also doing it internationally through the work that they they have done uh, on a consultancy basis in, in many other countries. And I think. Beyond Borders and similar organisations around the world are absolutely critical in all of this because you can't really get these discussions going simply with the two sides to a conflict. Uh, you need an external party who will come in and bring people together and explore the issues and, uh, and keep the discussion going when it gets tough, but step back perhaps when it's going a bit more smoothly. And uh, I think Beyond Borders is doing great work on that internationally at the moment, but it's also here at Traquair bringing people together to think. And at, and at a time when, particularly in Western Europe, uh, you know, thinking is is not necessarily the word you would associate with political discussion. You know, we see these are terrible times for uh, uh, reactionary attitudes to things like migration and uh, yeah. people disadvantaged from other parts of the world. And I think if we can find a way here in these beautiful Scottish borders to, to discuss uh, these issues in a more open and progressive way, then uh, the folks here at Traquera are doing a fantastic job.
I think also you're, you're, you're absolutely right about the need for dialogue and my experience is that sometimes uh, parties who can't really talk together mm. at home yeah. um, can meet and bond and start to discuss the yep. issues in a much more relaxed way abroad and um, I know that Traquera has been a very very good venue for, mm. for that sort of uh, thing so there is a future for soft mediation. Absolutely and, and I think perhaps I mean, somewhere like Scotland that doesn't have the the baggage of, for want of a better description, the national state, uh, um, and 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 all the issues that are associated with that around the world, positive and negative, uh, uh, but still has a clear historical and current identity uh, and a bit of you know thoughtful space. I think someone like Scotland can play a big role in that, and uh, you know, places like Traquair and. Uh, and one or two other places elsewhere in Scotland. Uh, I think are places where people could come together without worrying about the baggage of the past um, or the connections that might be drawn from, from just simply being here. And do uh, you think this is something which uh, uh, enjoys consensus among the various parties in Scotland? I think so. Yeah, we might disagree on uh, the relationships that we have within the United Kingdom, but I think there's a general view in Scotland that Sco uh, that we are strongest when we're looking internationally and when we're open. Um, there's always a danger when so much of our politics is dominated by a debate about nationalism, um, if I can put it like that, that we turn uh, uh, inwards. Uh, and I, but I think there is a desire amongst um, senior people in, in, in most of the parties and in Scottish life generally to try and ensure that Scotland still looks outwards and is still contributing. Well, Scots are more internationalists, aren't they, than, mm. uh, the, uh, than, the, than the general uh, spread of uh, yeah. opinion in, uh, in Britain. I mean, people talk about Little Englanders, but I don't hear people talking very much about Little Scotlanders. No, there's still that element of Little Scotland that went in relation to England. And that, yeah. and that, and that happens in small countries and big countries next to each other. Yeah. But they, they um, and it can happen between two cities, never mind two countries, but they, uh, I, I think both economically, but also academically uh, uh, and, 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 and diplomatically. Scots have made a fantastic contribution elsewhere in the world. We've done some bad things as well over the years, and we should be honest about that. Now, Glasgow was built on the tobacco trade and to some extent the slave trade. Uh, but we've also done some good things and we've contributed a lot. And there's no reason in the 21st century why that shouldn't seem to be the case. And you know, this, this operation, Beyond Borders, is a great example of a little idea that has grown and flourished. And, and helps make that contribution. Thank you very much. I think that's a good note on which to end. Sure. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoyed it.